Hello, chapter four, the tree of life. This is uh, another way to put it is uh, phylogeny. So this chapter is on phylogeny. So that was the tree of life was Darwin's metaphor for evolution. And, you know, if you just, it's just like branch, you know, he envisioned evolution to be like a tree. So you just follow the branches and they become more numerous and more numerous. Um, they branch out to like one branch will branch out to a bunch of other branches. Sometimes they, they get terminated. Sometimes they, you'll find a lot of branches growing off of one branch, sometimes only a few. So anyway, this is essentially uh, phylogeny. And of course, the similar idea is the family tree. You know, so when you when you map that out and you look at your siblings versus first cousins versus second cousins, right? You could trace everything back and find like a common ancestor. So if you were to do that, take an organism and all its descendants, that's a clade. And I'm kind of telling you here. Um, you know, if you just take one branch kind of at the end of the tree and you trace it back all the way, then that would be a clade. So evolutionary biologists look at different organis organisms and they kind of want to see what traits they share. So you can use, like you try to create a map and you can try to figure out, for example, um, you could try to figure out a missing link. So you want to, um, and we're going to get, we're going to, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this, but you know, you, you, you look back, you see what's missing. You see the time period that the organism lived before and after. And then there's that middle part missing. So you kind of have an idea where to look because you know the age of the thing that came before it and the thing that came after it. So that gives you kind of an idea of what kind of rock layer to look in. And um, you look and see where things after or things before were found. So that would kind of give you an idea of a place to look. And then you kind of see if you find the things that you expect, but the hypothesis, you know, the educated guess, you develop that when you kind of make this family tree or this, uh, this phylogeny. So, However, it's, it's possible, and what happens is you have things like a convergent evolution. And to give you an example of that, um, when you look at uh, like flying squirrels, so there's flying squirrels, and there's these other things called sugar gliders, and they both look the same. And so if you just look at their bones, it was thought, oh, well, these, um, these both, you know, have a common ancestor. But when we were able to look at um, DNA sequencing, we found out that they're actually not related. You know, one of them is more like a marsupial. So they didn't come necessarily from a common ancestor, but they had the same selective pressures on them that caused them to develop like this membrane on their arms that allows them to glide. So we call that convergent evolution. And, and I guess a, a good example would be, um, you know, organisms that can fly, right? We're not going to put bats, insects, and birds in the same category. You know, one has a membrane between their digits. You know, insects use something called like chitin, and, and birds have feathers. So there were similar pressures that, that led them to fly, but they don't come from a common ancestor. So that's an example of uh, convergent evolution. So those are like uh, analogies. So we have to be careful. You don't wanna confuse a common ancestor with a convergent trait. <clears throat> So we're going to look at four different questions and examine it through the lens of phylogeny.
How did we get on land? How did organisms move from water to land? Um, mammals have a pretty intricate set of um, bones in their middle ear. How did we get those? Where did they come from? Then we're going to look at how did birds fly? How did they come to fly? And then how did, how did, um, how did we end up standing up straight? How did we become bipedal? So let's look first at some fish. So if we want to look at, if, we, if we're going to ask the question, how did we move from water to land, then a good place to start would be, let's try to find the, what we think is the oldest fish out there, right? Because obviously a tetrapod, and I put here, you know, four-legged animal, tetra meaning four and pod meaning legs. Um, so something with like four limbs, um, that's obviously very different from a fish. So if you, if you want to try to make a, a connection there, we have to, we should probably look at some fish that would most likely resemble, um, you know, tetrapods. So you would use an evolutionary tree for that. You would trace, you could trace, well, you could do it either way. You could try to go forward from like fish and, and, and try to see what has become advanced, or you could go from tetrapods and start working backwards until you find something that you think might have been in the water. And a, a good example of, of doing that was with um, the first chapter. When we talked about uh, whales. So the closest fish related to tetrapods are called coelacanthins, coelacanths, I'm sorry. And then there's lung, lung fishes. So they're both, and they're both around today. So you can find coelacanths, they're around uh, Indonesia and I, I've posted a, a small video on that where you can see what they look like. Um, lung fishes, obviously as, as the name implies, they're kind of different too in that they have lungs. Well, something close to lungs. But anyway, they do not have webbed fins like other fish. So they have a they have like a structure of bones covered with like a membrane. So we call these lobes. So they're not fins, they're lobes. And so we call both of these fish lobe fins. So we have an idea about lobe fin fish. You know, they have bones covered with membranes, you know, lobes, and um, they still exist. So we can look at examples that exist today. Can we find fossils from the earliest lobe fins? So that was the question. And they go back about 400 million years ago. So, I mean, yes, obviously they've been found. And the first fossils were found in the late 1800s. So the first, some of the first that were found were called Eustinopterons. So they lived around, you know, we're going back around 400, 385 million years ago. And so, you know, this is just kind of a, you know, all these are not the fish, obviously, they're just um, renditions of them. So, they had in their limbs shoulder bones extending out. And these limbs over here had just like in just like in our body. So these are bones like the humerus. The humerus is the bone in your upper arm, and then your forearm has the, the radius, which is like the bone on the side of your thumb, and then the ulna, which is on the other side. You know, it'd be like on the pinky side of your hand. Right, so that, those are three bones that we have in our arms, the, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. Um, so they found, you know, these bones are in this fish. And then if you look at the, the radial fin in the back, you're going to see a femur, a tibula, a tibia, and a fibula, which are, again, similar to our bones, right? The femur is the upper leg, and then you've got two bones in your 
shin, the lower leg, the tibia and the fibula. So there's, there's something about this, this fish. On its own, we can't necessarily make a conclusion. It's just an interesting thought. But now you can say, well, okay, can we find other fish that lived later or earlier that would kind of fill in this story, right? And you start, you start plotting it on your tree. So now we're gonna put the Eustenopteron on our tree and then we're gonna look at see if there's anything before or after. Here is another one that lived around 365 million years ago. So a little bit newer. Um, so the, the Acanthostega, this is just like a skeleton of it, but it had complete limbs, right? So this is a step up from the, the, the Houston Optron, right? So this is like, so here it's not limbs, they're more kind of like lobes. Here we're kind of getting to limbs, but it's something that lives in the water. So it had the same traits as, it had similar traits to both the Houston Optron and the lobe fins. However, the skeleton, and when, I, when I'm saying skeleton, you know, we're talking about like these areas of the limbs, they're not, you know, it, it looks like it could walk on land, but the skeleton can't support the weight of the organism. So that would suggest, that would suggest that it's not, you know, this was something that might have been adapted, you know, that, that, that could be adapted to land, but it's still essentially a water dwelling creature. It does have, this is what's kind of interesting, this one does have bones for supporting gills. It had a bone structure to support gills. Now we're going a little bit earlier, or I should say a little bit closer. Um, so the, the Tiktaalik was found not too long ago, just recently. It had a neck, so it could, it could turn its head. Right, it kind of looks like an alligator, right? So it could turn its head. Um, it did not have any fingers though. It did not have any digits. It was thought, but you know, the, 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 the structure, the structure of the limbs, it was thought that it was able to like prop itself up on rocks and um, push itself right onto the shore. So they're kind of showing in this rendition that they're implying that it was primarily on land. You know, this was a water dwelling creature that would be able to come on land here and there. So um, this guy Schubin, he did a lot of the, the, the latter work like in the, in the 90s on, on some of this stuff. And so, the, you know, how is he, he, he's the one that found this one and he found it, this, this is an uh, Inuit word. So this was found in uh, Nunavut, which is like, you know, the um, very upper part of um, Canada. So how did he know where to look? How did he know what layer of rock to look? How did he know a location to work? Well, he looked at the phy phylogeny of it. He looked at the at the tree of life, right? Um, so he looked at the Eustenopteron and he looked at the uh, Acanthostega and you know, where were they found? We, we know the age of these two, right? So we're talking about um, 360, 370, 380. So this is all, this is a period and we haven't talked about any of the periods yet, but this is the Donovan period. So he knew what period it was in. This also uh, let him know that, you know, what layer of uh, rocks to look in. And it also led to a possible location. I mean, did they know for sure? No, they were hypothesizing. They were, they were guessing, you know, and part of it is that, yeah, no one ever went this far up into Canada to take a look. I think this was a good you know, based on some other factors, this is probably a good place to look, right? And so they looked, they, they looked first, they, 
they they guessed what they were going to see there. They looked, they ended up finding it. So that's just a quick example. I've got there's just two videos on on this if you wanted to take a look. All right, so let's move on to the the development of the ear. So there's three there's three very intricate tiny bones in our middle ear. Um and and you know the 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 vibrations of sound get amplified significantly in there and then um gets delivered to our nerve cells. All right, but we have to keep in mind that you know people you know, one of the, if you go back to like the first lecture, one of the things that we, that, that people misunderstand about evolution is that things get just created, right? No, things are built on other things that have already existed. <clears throat> so if we look at that, we would say that the three little bones, the smallest bones in our body by far, these three little ear bones, um, they didn't just appear, they should have been part of another bone. And so even if you were to try to check out the skull of, you know, the human skull, for example, you would try to guess where these bones were, you might say that they came from the jaw because that's kind of where they are. You just feel the, the back of your jaw and you're kind of there at your, at your ear. So it's, you know, it's hypothesized that these bones were used for biting, that they were part of the jaw at one time. So before we jump into it, let's look at different mammals, different types of mammals. So just to kind of recap, we never really um, talked about it specifically, but, you know, mammals have, have hair and they produce milk. It's kind of one of the main things. Um, so mammals if you follow mammals back you take their clade and you follow a mammal back all the way so that whole clade we call synapsid so these are synapsids early synapsids are kind of like reptiles so that's what that's at least what we think so what do they all have in common if you look at our skull if you if you study bones a lot of the bones are are pretty easy like if you study bones in a human if they're they're not too difficult. Like we've already talked about the bones in the arm, bones in the leg. There's a few things that get kind of tricky. One of them is like your ankles and your wrists. There's a lot of there's it's like eight bones in your in your wrist. So it gets a little bit difficult, right? But the other place that's difficult for people is the skull. Right. So the skull actually has quite a few bones. Like our skulls have a lot of bones. And um, some of them are shaped kind of predictably like your frontal bone and occipital bone but you know a lot of the bones are they just have weird shapes and 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 there's the way it fits together is is really strange i mean just google um the bones of the skull and 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 you'll see what i'm saying so um synapses they they ha that's what we have in common these skull bones and and the way that they fit together so there's like similar um, sutures and fissures and things like that. So anyway, let's go into mammals. So there's three actually, and here's the first one, monotremes. And then I, um, the other two are right here. They're, these are both called therians. So group one, here's the second group, and the eutherians are the third group, All right? So the monotremes, there's not, there's the duck-billed platypus, and then there's like one other, and I don't remember what it is, but they're, they're like in Australia. And so they produce milk, but like, like other mammals, they don't produce it through a nipple. So, and, and they lay eggs, which is obviously not like other mammals, right? So most mammals, most mammals are therians and they produce live young. So the question is, do you produce young that are able to, live on their own like like we do not that a baby can live on its own but you know what i'm saying they're usually they're 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 breathing all you have to do is you know they they need milk and you know but they're they're breathing on their own and and they're not you know we don't consider them embryos at that point right but marsupials they 
their young are born much sooner and then you know they climb into the pouch and finish their development there whereas eutherians um you know they're fed by a placenta they develop completely inside and then they're born ideally completely developed so the early synapsids could most likely feel i mean we don't really know but they most likely can feel vibrations in their jaw and they probably use that as kind of like a signal of what to go after what to eat or not to eat but looking at bones we figured out that the that the middle ear started out as the back part of the lower jaw so we call the jaw the dentary you know where all the teeth are right so these the back part of the jaw started shrinking as the front part of the jaw started getting larger so the fossil record has shown that as time went on the front part of the jaw got more pronounced with teeth the back part of the jaw kind of got smaller and then it broke away from the back part of the jaw and formed the bones that are the middle ear so let's look at the third thing flight um so one of the earliest birds or flying creatures i should say one of the earliest fossils that was discovered was in the 1860s so we're talking not too long after um darwin right so when darwin died there was talk of fossils and stuff but it really wasn't that well developed just you know 10 even really a very short time after his book it had already been developed a little more right so we have we have this early um one of the earliest known fossils okay archaeopteryx i hate these words archaeopteryx the by the way you see a lot in these words that i've been saying the p-t-e-r that just means like wings um so this is the earliest known fossil of a bird around 145 years ago it, but it's very interesting in that if you look at its wings at like the top of the wing there's like these claws on it it's like a wing with a claw and then they had a beak kind of like birds but it had teeth in it and then it had a tail and its tail was with scales and things like that so it's kind of like a reptilian tail so we consider where did birds come from they came from dinosaurs that's the thought so this was a different type of bird but people were wondering where did it come from and what about the feathers did 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 the feathers did the bird, did this thing start flying and then develop feathers to make it fly better or did the feathers come first for like some other reason so because of the fossils we've been able to find in the last 40 years we've understood that these are remnants of dinosaurs birds came from dinosaurs because we found dinosaurs that we know did not fly but nevertheless they had feathers so why would a dinosaur have feathers if it's not going to fly and that also answers our question of what came first right the feathers came first then flight came so why why would they have feathers and here are some possible explanations so if you remember biomarkers biomarkers are like chemicals that you could sometimes find in fossils if you could find traces of chemicals then that will give you an idea about things so one of the chemicals you can find would relate to color if you find pigment and me, maybe you can understand what color the organisms were. Well, we find lots of melanosomes. Like if you're thinking melanin, it's the same idea. Right? So we find lots of melanosomes. These are like uh, organelles in a cell that produce pigment. So anyway, we're finding pigment. We know that, that these feathers were quite colorful. And so 
we think that this was possibly used for reproduction to to attract the opposite sex <clears throat> but you know the guess is also that they were used for to keep eggs warm and so even you look at at birds today that are flightless birds and they can go through that motion of flapping their wings so they're not flying but they're flapping their wings why why would they flap their wings if they're not going to go anywhere and you know again this is just kind of a guess maybe it helped them run maybe for running up a hill or maybe it kept them um, balanced or it helped them with direction so in 1993 this kind of provides proof of another answer we found when i say we i obviously don't mean myself but they found a fossil of an oviraptor. So OVI is eggs and a raptor is like with claws. So we think that this was, that this dinosaur was like an eggs, up to this point, we think that it was an egg stealer because we found, you know, they found this dinosaur with eggs all the time. So like, well, this is an, this was a dinosaur that, you know, based on the morphology of how it's shaped and stuff, this was a dinosaur that like stole eggs and ate eggs a lot. Um, well, after this finding, the suggestion is that no, actually no, it's the, this is, was the dinosaur's eggs. And because this fossil was not, it's not only that we found the fossil, we found the eggs as well. And, and this bird had its wings like spread over the eggs like it was protecting it. So, um, and, and many birds still do that today. So birds still do this behavior. We find um, oviraptors, which is a, clearly a, a dinosaur. <coughs> By the way, dinosaurs lived until about 65 million years ago. <coughs> so let's look at the last thing. And I'm actually not gonna talk a lot about this because we have a whole chapter on this and um, it's actually quite a lot of information. So I'm just touching on it. But um, when Darwin wrote his book, he knew that it was one thing to say that some animals might have come from other animals. And that's kind of what he was saying. And that was all kind of revolutionary. But he drew the line at talking about humans because he knew if he did that, that's like going too far, right? And then people aren't going to believe him. And people are going to dismiss him. And everyone's going to get caught up in that controversy by itself. And so the whole, you know, it won't be about the book and about his theories and about any proof that he had. It would be about, wait, you're saying that man came from apes, right? So he didn't talk about it. He didn't put it in his book, but he thought about it and he did write some ideas in other places. And anyway, you know, about 10, 12 years later, he finally did write a book called his second book, The Descent of Man. And he did put some of these ideas out there, right? So the public had a good decade to chew on it and talk about it and, and um, consider his other ideas. Then he, then he dropped this book, right? And so he talks about a couple of things humans had vestigial structures. And so if you think about, you know, why are there nipples on a man? Why, um, what's the appendix do, right? There's things in us that we don't necessarily need. And then the most famous one, of course, is our tailbone, the, um, the coccyx bone. Um, there are actually a few bones put together, this, this, the sacrum and the coccyx, there are a few bones fused together it's like a little tiny uh, tailbone at the bottom of your skeleton. So right at the bottom of your vertebrae. So Darwin thought, you know, you wouldn't design a human with something that you don't need, like the remnant of a, of a tail. Why would you design a human with this? 
And so that was a question that he had. He's not making any judgments, but just that was a question that he had. And then he also, when he looked at primates, he noticed that they had facial expressions that were similar to ours. Their, their patterns of expression, there were similarities. And so these things kind of led him to think, well, you know, were we, were we from this line? You know, and did we perhaps split from them and start walking upright more? So again, we're not talking about, about it now because it's a whole chapter, but he did write that, you know, he thought one day we'll find, find these fossils. Because remember back then, you know, he had an idea of fossils, but it really wasn't, um, it was really still kind of new and um, it was really undeveloped. But he thought one day we're gonna find fossils that will fill in these gaps that will make the link between humans and other primates. And we found many examples, which is again, a whole, a whole chapter, right? And I believe it's like a chapter 14. So we found a whole, there's a, there's a whole chapter on this. <clears throat> so I'm gonna stop it here and feel free to reach out to me with any questions.